Hiya, my name's Nicola Davis and I'm talking to you today from my studio in West Wales in Pembrokeshire where it's very very cold which is why I've got so many layers on. Now I've got a few little rhymes for you um, sort of related to some of the animals that are mentioned in Shakespeare's play. I'm going to start with one which is um, which is actually about hedgehogs. Um, hedgehogs are mentioned uh, in lots and lots of places and they were a very very familiar animal to people living at Shakespeare's time although they're quite rare in the UK today. In fact when I was a little girl which is not quite as long ago as Shakespeare's time they were very common. So it's called urchin which is one of the old names for hedgehogs. Urchin. A spiky ball, a spiny spinner, a curling, rolling, badger's dinner, a snuffle sneezer, eating slugs, worms and beetles, earwigs, grubs. I miss you hedgehog, furs pig, urchin, hotchy witchy, garden searching. Hotchy witchy is um, one of the old Romany names for hedgehogs. They've got lots and lots of different names in different parts uh, of the UK. Now in, um, in Julius Caesar, one of the characters says, unicorns are betrayed by trees and bears by glasses. Now this is repeating um, a, an old myth about bears being very very confused by mirrors, that's what they mean when they say glasses, it's not glasses like these, it's mirror glasses. So I, I thought I'd do um, a little rhyme. Now you can do this as a game so you need two people to be saying the rhyme together and one of you needs to be the bear taking a look at itself in the mirror uh, and the other one needs to be the bear's reflection so you need to watch the bear very very carefully so that you mirror exactly what they do so bear in a looking glass bear in the looking glass what do you see two eyes and a nose could it be me big paws four of those claws on all toes one ear and one ear and enormous rear I'd have to get close to be certain and sure but it seems that the bear in the glass has a roar and then you can run away from each other at top speed and you can take it in turns one person being the bear and the other person being the reflection and add all sorts of movements to it I think you'd have quite a lot of fun with that um, there are cats in lots of places in Shakespeare's play um, but in medieval times uh, and uh, uh, and further on people believed that cats were uh, had a kind of supernatural power and quite often that um, witches could turn themselves into cats um, and the witches in Macbeth make quite a lot of references to cats and to uh, Grey Malkin uh, and Grey Malkin, a Malkin is another name for a cat um, and of course in our lives we have domestic cats that we're very fond of but cats have a kind of double life don't they because they're you know they're a soft old moggy who purrs when you scratch them behind the ears when they're inside but when they're outside they're actually part of the wild. They're a very, very different creature. And that's what this little poem is about. Grey Malkin. Inside the house, he's old sock grey, like porridge on a rainy day, like Tuesday morning, mouldy bread, like snot or dust beneath the bed. But outside the door, he's secret grey like sea mist at the break of day, like moonlight on a midnight street and silent steps of unseen feet, like smoke that swirls and disappears and spells whispered into pointed ears. No sleepy moggy on a mat. Now he's Grimalkin, witch's cat. Uh, and the last little rhyme I've got for you here um, actually needs, leads into um, the play whose story I'm going to tell you. It's called On the Bat's Back. One of my favourite, favourite, favourite bits of, of Shakespeare um, that I actually learnt as a song when I was at school is Ariel's Song. Uh, and one of the lines in it is On the Bat's Back, 
I do fly. And I always loved that idea of getting onto the back of a bat and flying away into the night. So this is what this little rhyme is about. It's called On the Bat's Back. Small. I'll wait for my cockerel to stop crowing outside, shall I, and do it again. OK, so it's called On the Bat's Back. Small, like a cobnut that fell from a tree. On an airy mouse steed, you are tiny and free. Feel the thistle-down fur and the leathery wings and fly through the woods where the nightingale sings. Follow the moths through the space between leaves where shadowy moonlight dances and weaves. Learn all the star-scattered secrets of night to hold in your heart when dark turns back to light. Okay, so I, I mentioned that that story about on the bat's back, flying on the bat's back, came from um, one of Shakespeare's plays. Actually, many people's favourite play, probably my favourite play, apart from Romeo and Juliet maybe, um, which is The Tempest. So I'm just going to retell you the plot of The Tempest. So the story begins when a huge ship is destroyed and wrecked in this massive storm and all the people on the ship become separated in the sea and they all end up on the same island but not all in the same place on the island. And this island is magic and it has a master who's called Prospero. And Prospero's got a magic staff and a book and these objects give him enormous magical powers and allow him to command two spirits uh, a good one, a kind one, called Ariel, and a very angry, cross, grumpy one called Caliban. Uh, and they are both forced to serve Prospero and his beautiful daughter, Miranda. Now, going back in time before the start of the play, many years before, Prospero was the Duke of Milan. But he was, he was driven out by his wicked brother, Antonio, who rebelled against him and made himself into the new leader. And then Antonio told Prospero, you've got to go, get away, go away from Milan, never want to see you again. And poor old Prospero managed to escape in a boat along with his baby daughter Miranda. And that's how they got to this island. And they arrived there with the staff and the book and Prospero was able to use those to make some sort of strange and magical life for himself on this island. Now then, Back in the present, the ship that's just got wrecked on Prospero's island, guess who's got, got aboard it? It's Antonio, his brother, who years before did the dirty on him and sent him away from Milan. And also um, Antonio's friend, the King of Naples, plus the King's son, Ferdinand. Now, Poor old Ferdinand gets washed up on one side of the island and Antonio and the King of Naples get washed up on the other. And Ferdinand doesn't know that his father is safely washed up on the island. He thinks his father's drowned. And so he's terribly, terribly upset. And, you know, he starts crying and he's in a right old state. And he suddenly, in the middle of all this sorrow, he sees this beautiful girl who is Miranda and he falls instantly in love with her and promises to make her Queen of Naples. Now, Prospero is very happy about this because he knows that Ferdinand is very important and very powerful. And um, what Prospero does, he makes lots of beautiful spirits appear towards them, appear to them. So they have this great kind of engagement enchantment all around them. But on the other side of the island, Caliban is getting very fed up of being Prospero's slave and he begins to stomp about and curse him at, and he hears a voice and he thinks Prospero's spirit servant is tormenting him so he hides underneath his big cloak. Now the voice isn't the spirit but the king's servant who's also been washed up on the island uh, and the king's servant got lost and he's been wandering around the island and when he sees Caliban hiding he mistakes this big giant for an enormous smelly fish. I know, it's a bit bonkers. Anyway, uh, the servant 
Trinculo is very frightened by the big storm and he hides under the cloak and he doesn't realise that Caliban's under there as well. Uh, and then he hears his voice, this voice, this voice of Stefano, who, like him, has been tossed into the sea after the shipwreck. So there's Stefano and Trinculo uh, underneath his cloak and they're whispering to each other and talking to each other. And suddenly they realise they've been reunited and they're so happy to be reunited. And then Caliban, hearing them talking, steps out from under his cloak and reveals himself. Um, and then Stefano offers Caliban a sip of wine and Caliban enjoys the taste so much that he thinks that Stefano is a god and offers to show him the whole island. Okay. So that's all very complicated and bonkers. Anyway, meanwhile, Prospero wants to take revenge against Antonio for stealing Milan and his title and his house and, you know, everything that he was enjoying there. So he sends Ariel, this is the kind of quite nice spirit, to torment Antonio and the King of Naples. Ariel sings songs to confuse them and he makes a huge feast appear in front of them and then he makes it disappear when they touch it and then he sets dogs on them and he even appears before them in the shape of a, a giant scary bird. Finally, Ariel says he feels rather sorry for Antonio and the King of Naples and Prospero decides to be kind and he reveals himself to them and he makes friends with the King of Naples and after he offers his daughter Miranda in marriage to Ferdinand. Of course, Ferdinand and Miranda are very pleased about this. Prospero then says that he forgives everybody, uh, forgives for Antonio for being banished, and he decides to leave the island behind in charge, in the charge of Caliban. And he sets Ariel free from his servitude. And he sails away with everybody back to Naples for the wedding feast with Ferdinand and Miranda. And at the end, Prospero asks the audience for a round of applause so that he can leave the stage and return home. So it's all kind of really strange and magical, but it's lovely. It's an absolutely lovely story. And Ariel is just such a totally great, otherworldly, wonderful, wonderful character.